exciting day. First Sunday in the sanctuary with our carpet. Praise the Lord. Doesn't it look beautiful? We are, uh, yeah, you can clap. You can clap for carpet. Well, you can clap at church. You can laugh at church. You can smile at church. And you can laugh at my jokes at church. <laughs> Don't even laugh at that. <laughs> All right, we are glad you're here. We've got some exciting baptisms. Uh, I do know one thing. I'm glad we got carpet in the sanctuary. Next thing we're going to do is get a baptism heater. <laughs> it's a little chilly up here today. So um, we, we have, we have, it's an exciting morning. It really is. We're glad you're here with us. If you're a guest, a visitor, and right in front of you is a little card. If you want to fill that out and put that in one of our offering boxes, we would love to use that as a means to get to know you. And so, um, so we've got some exciting baptisms this morning. We've got two baptisms from the same family. First, we have a, a Sadie. Come on. You can clap, too. All right. Uh, Sadie gave her life to Christ on Christmas night. Amen. Amen. Yeah. service, I would pray for these two. I would pray for, uh, especially for, for Sadie, Lord, I would ask that you would walk with her, you would um, you would shape and craft her into a mighty, mighty woman for you. And Father, I pray for Alan, I pray that he would be a, a godly grandfather, lead his family. Lord, I just thank you that you continue to change lives. And as we embark on worship this morning, we would just ask that everything we say Every word, every syllable, every sentence, every note, every song, everything would be aimed at your glory. And that we would walk out and say, more than anything, that we had encountered you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'll uh, kill a moment or two while I move this around. The pastor's comment on no telling what you might say was reference to... The fact that he's been smelling carpet glue all week.
Give us a second. We're going to start out this morning by singing Blessed Assurance. It is going to be exactly the same words and music. A little jazzier. So let's all stand together and sing Blessed Assurance.
back up tonight, uh, this afternoon at 4.30. So feel free to join. If you've never joined, uh, other than a small entry fee, it's uh, pretty much straightforward. So. <laughs> All right, if you've got your Bibles, if you'll take a turn with me to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 17. While you're making your way there to Luke chapter 5, I would ask you, I wonder if any of you have ever had a friend that, uh, well, some of you have never had friends, but anyway, that's all another joke. See, you can laugh at church. All right, so I wonder if some of you have ever had a friend that has let you down. I mean, you just, you know, you needed them. I mean, you really needed them. You, it was that moment where you needed some help, and you called them. And you said, hey, man, today's the day. I need some help. And they said, uh, well, it's Monday, and Alabama's playing for a championship, so I can't come. I'm going to have that problem Monday night. So we have friends through the years, everyone does, that's just kind of disappointed you. So this morning we see in a text in Luke chapter 5 about a friends that let their friend down. But he didn't let them down in a bad way. He let them down in a good way. And they did something supernatural to get their friend in front of Jesus so that, so that the Lord could heal this, uh, this friend. So if you have your Bibles, if you'll stand in honor of the reading of the Lord's Word, beginning in verse 17, here's what it says. On one of those days, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. And they come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed. And they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof. And they let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith... He said, man, your sins are forgiven. And the scribes and the Pharisees began questioning, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sin but God alone? And when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them. Why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or to say, rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And immediately he rose up and before them and he picked up what he'd been lying on and he went home glorifying God. And amazement seized them all. And they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, we have seen extraordinary things today. Amen. You may be seated. So I just want to share with you this morning um, uh, four, four or five thoughts with you about this text and, uh, and its application for us, its application for us as believers. And uh, I'll just give you a little bit of, 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 of understanding of what these guys were getting ready to do. Now, first, I'll just remind you of this. It really isn't a point, but I'll just remind you of this, that this place was cluttered because of critics. Now, think about this. Here's these friends trying to bring their buddy in in front of Jesus. And the room is full. We learn this also in Mark's gospel in the second chapter. That they're just, they're, the place is cluttered with people trying to, uh, to, to really block out what Christ is doing. And you find the Pharisees and the teachers of the law sitting there. Now imagine that. You want to get your friend to the Lord to be healed. And cluttering the doorway are these critics and often that's the way it is, that there are a lot of folks in the way trying to stop great things from happening, especially in the Gospels. You see this over and over. Now, understand this, too, that this was kind of a, a makeshift home, nothing we would be a, 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 akin to today. And so maybe even a mud hut with sort of a thatched roof together. And so these guys, we're going to find out in a minute, these guys are going to dismantle the roof. They're going to take the roof off. So they can lower their buddy in to get to Jesus, right? Very clear they weren't Baptists because they'd had a business meeting and they had a proposal of how much it was going to cost and a timeline and all of that. I mean, these guys just got to work. So here's 
Five thoughts for you this morning about this text. Here's the first thing. Is these caring friends are our model. These caring friends are our model. When you sit and you say, man, what kind of friend do you want to be to the lost or to people who need to get in front of Jesus? These guys, first of all, they cared. They cared. They had been carrying their, their, their friend around on a, on a, in a sense on a mattress, on a makeshift pallet. They'd been carrying him around who knows how long. Man, these guys loved their friend. They were caring. They cared about their friend. I would imagine today some of you care about some people you know that need to get before Jesus. They need to get in front of Jesus. And the first part of that, if we're going to model who these guys are, we need to care. We need to care about lost people. We need to care in 2022. We've been through so much in the last couple of years. So much of our vision has been blurred about things. This is a good year to get some focus in our life about people who don't know the Lord. And so they cared enough to get him there. They were urgent. They were urgent. Now imagine what they could have done. They could have got on the website and they could have checked out the tour of Jesus and figured out what's the next city he's going to. Will there be a thinner population there? Can we get good tickets? Let's just wait. Let's just wait and we'll catch Jesus in the next town. No, they were urgent. They said, today is the day of healing. We've heard about the ministry of Jesus. We know what he can do. Today is the day we're going to get our friend in front of Christ. And can you imagine they get there and the doorway is clear, uh, cluttered with the Pharisees and the teachers and the, and the scribes, the teachers of the law. And they're just, I mean, they're, their heart's broken. And so I think they become very intentional. They become very intentional and they say, we need a plan. Who wants to do this? Here's our plan. We're going to take the top off of this guy's house. How would that have felt if it was your house? <laughs> You'd have said, no, catch him in the next town. We're going to take the roof off of this house, and we're just going to lower our friend right down in front of the Lord. Man, could you imagine any more intentionality and urgency to get someone in front of Christ? Listen, I would imagine there are people here today who know Friends who need to know Jesus. And this year, I would encourage you to have an intentional and urgent plan. You might even start thinking about the Easter services. You might think about Good Friday. You might think about the sunrise service, the Easter Sunday morning service. And you might say, man, I want to get my friend here to hear the gospel. Even more intentional, you might say, this is the year that I'm going to learn how to share Christ, and I'm going to tell my friend about that. Tell you what, a little plug here. February 20th, Sunday night, 6 o'clock, right here. Whole association. Anybody wants to come? We've got a guy coming from Georgia named Steve Foster. He is going to talk to us and train us how to relationally share Jesus with our friends. So we might want to be intentional like these guys. They could have said, we're just going to keep carrying him around. They said, no, not today. Today. He's going to see the master. And so I would pray you would work, start working and thinking in your life about an intentional plan to get people in front of Christ. Here's a second thought for you. There's no forgiveness from God apart from faith in God. There's no forgiveness from God apart from faith in God. These guys also in Mark's gospel, it's even more clear in Mark's gospel, it appears as if the man has the faith. Certainly he's there. He's asked maybe even to go and see Christ. And so the Bible says that as they lower him down, he says to them, Jesus says to them, seeing their faith in verse 20, he saw their faith, not just the faith of the man, but probably the faith too of the men carrying him, saw their faith and he said to them, your sins are forgiven. Now, here's what I would imagine today with a crowd here this morning like this and in our first service as well. Someone here today has never been forgiven. Someone here today showed up for whatever reason, whatever reason the Lord brought you here this morning and you're here. And this is what you're thinking to yourself. I've never, ever genuinely been forgiven by God. And I'm going to tell you this. He wants to forgive you. He wants to forgive you. Everyone here including the preacher 
is a sinner that has an opportunity to be saved by grace. Amen. Don't ever walk out of church and think, well, I certainly am better than them. <laughs> no. We're all sinners. In fact, the Bible tells us so clearly, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Amen. That's everyone, every human being. Ephesians tells us that, that, that uh, we were by nature children of wrath. The Bible says, like the rest of mankind. Everyone else, everyone. And so we are all in need of forgiveness. But here's what I want you to hear. You can't have forgiveness apart from faith in God. If you want forgiveness that comes from God, that flows out from his love and his grace, you, friend, have to put your faith in God. You have to believe in God, believe in Christ, believe in his death and his resurrection, and that he wants to save you. And that's exactly what happened. So that mat, that mat comes down with that man on it, and Jesus is looking around in all of the creativity of the men, and he says, I see your faith. Your sins are forgiven. Someone today needs to hear that. And then I would say, uh, transactionally, it isn't just about being forgiven. Now we need to be people who forgive. You not only are a sinner, but we are approaching a holy God. All holy, holy. They cry out in the book of Revelation, holy, holy, holy. We sing the song in the Baptist hymnal. Holy, that he's holy. He's a holy God. And so we have sinned against him. We've sinned against God. In fact, uh, in Psalm 51, when David is approached by Nathan after his trans transgression with Bathsheba, he cries out in the psalm and he says, I've sinned against thee and thee alone. He knows where his sin rests and where it lies. And I want to say this, when we get genuine forgiveness... We ought to be people who are now willing to forgive others. Because David's sin was so great and it was against the holy God. There's no one on this earth. Hear this. There's no one on this earth that has transactionally sinned against you in any way greater than you have sinned against God. That's right. See, your debts were far greater. And so if we're going to be people who are willing to take the faith of God, put our faith in God, and accept his forgiveness, we then need to be people who are willing to forgive others. You're starting this year, where we're still in the single digits, nine days in. Are you going to forgive others this year? And let me tell you, I would imagine this morning some of you are here and you've been holding on to something for years. You've been holding on to some unforgiveness in your life for years. No one's exempt from it. I, I, just in the last few years, I've worked through some unforgiveness I had against someone. And here's the thing. They didn't even know it. They thought everything was okay and great. And I can almost remember where I was standing when I said, I need to forgive this person. The Lord has forgiven me. I need to work through this, through this thing in my life so that... So that my life is right before the Lord. As you start this year, some of you probably have this burden and this weight of just unforgiveness. I want you to be mindful of this. God's forgiven you. God's forgiven you in such a matchless way. And that maybe today, by the end of this day, you reach out to that person. Or if they don't even know, you begin to work through in, uh, forgiveness in your own life. And so there's no forgiveness apart from God. And you want to be forgiven. I want to be forgiven. There's no forgiveness apart from putting our faith in the Lord. But here, here this third thought. Jesus displayed his dominion over the physical to display his power over the spiritual. That's what he does. That's what he does. And in fact, the scribes, he, he forgives the guy. He says, your sins are forgiven. He forgives the guy. And, 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 and the scribes and the Pharisees, what, is it, what happens in the Bible? It says, they begin... To question, saying, wait a minute, is this man a blasphemer? He's blaspheming. Who, who can forgive sins but God alone? They know. They know what he's just said. 
They know that he has said, I'm, I have the power and the authority to forgive sins. And so they, they say, wait a minute. He's declaring himself to be something. He's saying he is God. And so, so we, <clears throat> we think about that. And then we think about this idea that next Jesus is going to say, what's harder, guys? He knows. He knows because he's God. It says Jesus perceived their thoughts. He knew what they were thinking. The Lord knows what you're thinking right now. And so the Lord knows what they're thinking. And here's, here's what he says. I hear you. He says, I hear you. He says, I understand what you're thinking in your own heart. So he says this to him. He says, what's easier, guys? What's easier, uh, Pharisees, for me to say your sins are forgiven? Or to say, young man, take up your pallet and walk. Take up your bed and walk. Now, one of those, again, anyone could have said, anyone could have said, I have the power to forgive sins, but Christ couples the spiritual with the physical. And he says, oh, I'll show you what's harder. What's harder is for me to instantly and immediately heal this man. So he heals him. And he says, take up your cross. Take up your power, excuse me, and, and just go. Go, you have been healed in the name of Christ. And so this is also modeled in the power of the cross. Think about this. Anyone could have went on Friday to the cross and said, I'm going to die for your sins. And he went and Christ did die and blood poured down that old rugged cross. And he died for my sins and your sins and the sins of the world. And then on Sunday, an empty tomb, a physical miracle Show demonstration over the spiritual. So when you ask the question, how can this preacher stand up here and tell me that God can forgive my sins? Well, I'll tell you where the evidence is. The evidence is in an empty tomb. Just like the evidence was in a rolled up mat that this man walked off with. And so can you imagine that moment? That moment is such a powerful moment to me. He, he says, take up his mat, and he grabs it, and he probably rolls it up and puts it under his arm. Can you imagine the burden that had been his whole life? All his whole life. He, he instantly probably looked for a dumpster, thinking, I will never, ever need this again. Praise the Lord. I have been healed. And Jesus was simply trying not just to heal the guy, but to heal his soul. Some of you came today with souls that are sick and in need of real forgiveness. Some of you came in a sense carrying, carrying a pallet and you've been sort of shackled to that in some way. You know, the Lord wants to set us free from that. He wants to set us free. In the Bible, like she says, he wants to set us free from the bondage of sin. He wants to make us, the Bible says, slaves to righteousness. He wants to make us possessions of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if you ever wonder, if you ever wake up in the morning and say, why in the world, how in the world did God forgive me? What evidence do I have? <clears throat> A stone that's been rolled away in the garden is the evidence that everything Christ said leading up to the cross was going to be validated. Amen. And the same is true here, right here in the power of this moment. Let me share another couple of thoughts with you is, is don't, um, don't forget who deserves the glory. Don't forget who deserves the glory. Man, I'm, glad, I'm grateful for some things. I'm grateful for carpet. I'm grateful that it matches the chairs. I'm grateful for kids that can put them back. I'm grateful for playgrounds. I'm grateful that we live in a country where I can go online and I can buy a Bible and I don't worry about the government tracking my purchase for a Bible, that it's printed, that I can give it away freely. Man, I'm grateful that we gathered together this morning to hear the word preached. We're not, we're not afraid. We're not scared. I'm grateful to God that, that we can worship the Lord. I'm grateful to God we can gather together and sing songs aimed at the glory of God. I'm grateful for even the opportunity to stand here and preach to you. And here, here's the thing. All of this is about the glory of the Lord. It's not about us. It's not about us. We glorify God because we have carpet. 
We glorify God because we have a playground. We glorify God because we have Keller Hall, a place to meet and to fellowship together. And hear what happens. I want you to hear what happens in this text. The Bible says that when they got done, you know what he did? The first thing he did, he picked up his mat. Read it there in verse 29. Immediately, he wasn't waiting on, on some, uh, no, no kind of action. I mean, this was immediate. Jesus said, be healed, pick up your mat and go. The Bible says he picked up the mat he'd been laying on and carrying it around and he went home glorifying God. And then hear what happens to everybody else. Amazement seized them all. And they glorified God. Everything we have is for the glory of God. Not about me, not about you, not about a denomination, not about anything else, but our desire to glorify Him with all that we have and all that we are. That's what our life is about. Our life is about returning to God glory to him because listen to this he deserves it Amen. Amen. he deserves all of the glory I mean look this guy could have got up rolled up his mat put it under his arm and he could have said like all, many of us would thank you friends thank you for bringing me here I really appreciate this in fact when I get a job first thing I'm going to do I'm going to buy y'all some gift cards <laughs> no he knew who had changed him and it was God Almighty. Listen, if you've been forgiven here today, if you've been forgiven, it, it, it isn't anything you've done. It's aimed at the glory of God. Listen, the fact that I can even stand here, I shared this in the first service. The fact that I can even stand here and open the Bible and preach is to the glory of God. It really is. I've shared this several times. I'm not kidding. It's not hyperbole. Preachers often talk in hyperbole. This isn't hyperbole. I remember sitting in English class and telling that English professor, God bless English teachers, but anyway, saying, I can make, I, I'm going to fail your little oral exam here because I'm not getting up and speaking in this class. I'll take an F and I'll still make a C and that's overachieving for me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I did, that's what I told him. And it's, it's to the glory of God that he would call someone out of the darkness and into the marvelous light from death to life and then call them into ministry to glorify him. Everything we do is about his glory. The fact we even met budget, had any money left over, the fact that the choir can sing on Sunday, it's about his glory. It's not about us. And so this guy knows what to do. He knows what to do. Glory to God. Can you imagine the rest of his life? He walked around talking about what God had done. And so even the people there were seized with amazement that he had, and they glorified God. Here, here's the last thought for you. Can, can I tell you this? God is still in this business. Amen. God is still in this business. Some of you walked in today with all sorts of burdens. You did. You walked in with all kinds of things. You walked in and you said, Lord, I just need you to do something supernatural today. Some of you have been praying for that friend for years. And you just say, man, I need to get him in front of God. This, is the, this was the word I needed. This was the encouragement I needed. I want to get my friend in front of Christ. I want him to hear the gospel. I want to tell you this. God is still in the business of doing extraordinary things. <laughs> And some of you have been waiting for the Lord to do something extraordinary. And I just want to come along and remind you of this. He still does it. Amen. Broken relationships, wayward kids, finances that are crumbling, marriages that are on the rocks. He still does extraordinary things. Now here's what happens. Sometimes we come to the Lord and we have a vision of what we want the Lord to do. We really do. We even pray and say, Lord, I'll work this one out for you. This is what it means to look like. <laughs> Y'all ever done that? Most of the time, anything I've prayed doesn't look like the way the Lord works it out. It's just the way the, way the, the Lord does it. And oftentimes it takes a long time. 
And so I've shared this with, with some of you or, or a few of you or maybe on a Wednesday night, but this was the most brilliant thing I ever said. It really was. Kids, if it wasn't so long, the kids ought to put it on the tombstone. One day, my <coughs> wife asked me, she said, is marriage everything you imagined? Yeah, some of y'all are laughing. <laughs> Do you know what kind of setup that is? <laughs> That's a setup, isn't it? It's a setup. And so I, I, uh, I said, I said, you know, honey, it's sort of like walking into a room that's dark. And you envision what it's going to look like when you turn the light on. And when you do turn the light on, it's so brilliant and beautiful and amazing that you can't even remember what you thought it was going to be like. <laughs> <laughs> Think about this. This guy's buddies bring him in to get healed. And he gets healed. They bring him in with the vision that if we can just get him in front of Jesus, he'll walk again. If we can just get him in front of the master, man, if we can just get him in front of Christ, we won't have to carry him around anymore. <coughs> he'll be well. You know what happens? He gets in front of Jesus, and there's a real healing that happens. Real healing that happens. Now think about this. In my sanctified imagination, I imagine that this guy never talked about the physical healing again. When people say, what happened that day those guys took the roof off of that building? They say, man, he says, man, I got in front of Jesus. I thought I was going to get healed. Thought, thought my legs were going to work again. But, oh, man, I encountered a guy, and he had the power to forgive sins. And one day I'm going to die, and I'm going to be with him. And I was radically saved. In fact, I became a follower of him. My friends didn't have to carry me around behind him anymore. I went with him. I got on tour with him. Man, I was going around doing ministry with him. Who knows? Never imagined what really would happen when he got in front of Christ. Some of you are praying God, do something extraordinary in my life. God, do something so big in my life. And here's the deal. When the Lord answers, it's going to be something you can't even imagine. It's going to be something you can't even imagine. And it's going to be so powerful. And you're going to say this. I don't even remember what I used to pray. Because what God did was extraordinary. What God did was extraordinary. So soon we'll, we'll have an invitation and we'll, we'll pray and we'll, we'll ask you to come to the altars if you need to or pray where you're at. But we'll sing that same song again. <clears throat> that God knows our name. You know this, just like the Pharisees, Jesus knew what they were thinking. You know that God knew this man's name before he even showed up? He did. In fact, Jesus knew the name of all of his friends. Jesus knew that how long he'd been paralyzed and why. All of this, the glory of God. You know this morning that God knows your name? If you've never even been forgiven of your sins, Jesus still knows your name. This morning, whatever your concern is, your burden, your pain, your hurt, whatever it is you're bringing that lost friend, Jesus knows their name. He knows his children. Just like I know my five children, I know their names, their middle names, when they were born, most of them's favorite color, favorite food. Some of them fluctuate on colors weekly, so you have to be careful. If you buy something, they'll say, that's not my favorite color anymore, Dad. You need to send an email out. <laughs> he knows us. And so even this morning, he knows what you brought in here. And he wants to do something this morning. In a minute, we'll, we'll just stand and we'll pray and we'll sing and we'll ask the Lord to do something in your life that only he can do. And then he'll answer your prayers in his way, in his time, and you'll, you'll kind of be like I was with the light switch. And you'll say, I don't even remember what I wanted the Lord to do because what he's done is far greater. He knows your name, friend, and he wants to do something.
And for some of you, he wants, he genuinely does, he wants to forgive you. He wants, to, you, you, he wants you to encounter him and put your faith in him. And maybe this morning you've even seen a, a young girl. You want to talk about glorifying God. Man, we, we ought to glorify God when we baptize people. Amen. It is a miracle that God works in people's lives and changes them. He's that powerful. And so maybe this is the day you say, I, I, I've never really met the Lord. But I want to meet him today and I want to be forgiven of my sins. And maybe even this morning some of you are wrestling with, with unforgiveness of others. Today may be the day you bring it to the altar. Pray right where you're at. Do something about it before the sun goes down. And let the Lord, let the Lord work in your life. Let's stand together and pray. Father, it's in the power of your name. There is no other name. No other name, heaven or on earth, by which we can be saved. And so this morning we come to you, and we, we would imagine there are lots of folks this morning, all sorts of things. Some are waiting for something extraordinary. Some, are, some have brought in with tight, clenched fists unforgiveness. And in the shadows of realizing the forgiveness that you have for us, might we, in turn, forgive others. Father, there are others this morning who need to follow you for the first time. Some need to be obedient. Some you need, need to unite with the church. All sorts of decisions. Father, I pray for those folks that came in today and it's been a burden. When I said extraordinary things, they knew exactly what has been a burden on their hearts. And God, I would pray you would in your time and in your way and in your power and in your authority that you would answer those prayers and that the glory that you would bring in those would be matchless compared, compared to, to the finite vision we have. Father, as we prepare to sing this, we know you know our name. And you know our burdens. And you know the lost that we long to see come to know you. Speak to us. In Christ's name.